Let's get started. Please welcome Katie Nichols. Good morning, everyone. I'm Katie Nichols. I work for MITRE, and I'm joined by John Wonder, also a MITRE employee. Also wanted to introduce Blake Strom in the second row, co-creator of Attack, and Adam Pennington, who's also on the Attack team. We're really excited to be here. Thank you so much to the B-Sides volunteers. Round of applause for them. It's awesome to be here. Um, as I mentioned, John and Adam and Blake and I work for the MITRE Corporation. If you're not familiar with MITRE, it's a nonprofit that works in the public interest. So we operate what are called federally funded research and development centers, FFRDCs, kind of a mouthful. Basically means that we do research and development and cool projects like ATTAC, which is what brings us here today, we're gonna talk about. So what we're gonna talk about is what ATTAC is and how it can help you up your game in defenses and addressing some of the common challenges we see. So let's dive in. Here's what we're gonna do today. Um, we're going to talk about the status quo, the challenges that we've seen. John and I have worked in network defense for many years along with the team. Some of the challenges that we see and how we think attack can help all those. We're going to explain what attack is, so if you've never heard of it, cool, no worries. Um, we'll bring you up to speed. If you have, you get a review. Then we're going to dive into how you can actually apply attack. My background is as a threat analyst, so I'm going to cover the threat intelligence portion. Then I'm going to throw it over to John to talk about how you can use attack for detection and analytics. Next, we're gonna tell you what's next on the attack agenda for us, and then wrap up. We'll take some questions and hear from you about how you're using attack, how you wanna use it, any feedback you have for us. So I've worked in a different security operations centers for eight or nine years now, and these are some of the questions that I and others in SOX face on a day-to-day -day basis. How effective are my defenses? This is an executive question all the time. How do I know how good we're doing? Do I have a chance at detecting APT28 or whatever the adversary of the day is? Is the data I'm collecting useful? I'm getting all these different log sources, but are they actually doing anything to detect these adversaries I care about? Do I have overlapping tool coverage? I bought these five awesome tools, but are they detecting on the same things and am I really getting the best bang for my buck there? And of course, it's Black Hat Week, so we have to talk about these shiny new vendor products, the machine learning blockchain AI. Is that product actually going to help us improve our defenses, or is it just another thing to use money on? So we see ATT&CK as having a place in helping us answer all of these tough questions. Another tough task for us is detecting TTPs. Uh, the defenders in the room are probably really familiar with David Pianco's Pyramid of Pain, which uh, models for us how painful it is for adversaries when we deny certain indicator types to them. So start at the bottom. Think about a malware file. If an adversary changes one bit of that file, the hash value will change, and so if you're detecting on that hash, you're not gonna find it anymore. So that's almost painless for an adversary, right? Domains and IP addresses, same thing. They can register new ones you know, under five minutes, easy. So if you're detecting on those things, they can change really quickly and you're probably not gonna catch those adversaries. So ideally, what you wanna be doing is detecting on adversary tactics, techniques, and procedures their behaviors, because that's the toughest thing, the most painful for them to change. And that's really easy, easy to say, right, but a little tougher to do. And we see attack as jumping in on that TTP part of the pyramid can help us there. So we don't hate indicators, but we know indicators probably feel a little bit slighted. Um, they definitely have a lot of value, especially doing things like um, who is lookups and trying to anticipate as people register new infrastructure. But they're not enough. They're necessary, but not sufficient. So don't hate on your indicators, but move towards CTPs. So what is attack? Simply stated, it's a knowledge base of adversary behavior. What can adversaries do? Whether it's before they've compromised you, how do they collect information about your organization? Whether it's how they compromise you through spear phishing, or then after you've gained, they've gained access to the network, what can they do within it? Things like moving laterally, establishing command and control, that type of thing. So some key points about ATT&CK. ATT&CK was created by a team up at uh, the Fort Meade MITRE site. Um, it was known as the Fort Meade Experiment. It was a series of red team, blue team exercises. The red team would do their thing and own the network, and then they would communicate with the blue team, hey, here's what we did. And those teams needed a way to communicate and they didn't really have anything like that, so that's how ATT&CK was born. 
And the team thought it might be useful for other people because they found it so useful. So it was publicly released in 2015. Another key point about attack, it's based on real world adversary behavior. The goal is not to enumerate everything anyone could ever possibly do because that would be unbelievably huge. Rather, the goal is to focus on what we know adversaries are doing or they're likely to do, things that cutting edge red teams do, because that's the way that we can prioritize based on adversary behavior, a threat based defense, right? Also, key to note that attack is free and open to anyone. If you're a student, you can use it to learn. If you're a vendor, integrate it into your products. If you're a SOC, use it for defenses. It's for everyone. It's very simple terms of use on our website, and that's really key. And you know, MITRE works in the public interest, and we think that having attack publicly open to everyone is in the public interest. Next, attack serves as a common language. There's so many times when I'm reading a threat report and I'm saying like, you're saying the adversary has moved laterally. I don't know what you mean. How did they do that? Attack can be that industry standard that we all point back to and say, hey, this is the technique that I'm talking about when I'm describing this behavior. Lastly, it's community driven. I mentioned that attack is free and open for everyone. We also rely on the community for information. We have a huge list of contributors. And MITRE, you know, we're the maintainers, but we do not have all the answers. We do not see all adversary activity. The people out there fighting these adversaries, you're the ones who do. So we really need you, the whole community, to help us out and make attack stronger for everyone. So that's what attack is, a knowledge base of adversary behavior. Another way to think about it is zooming in on the adversary life cycle, kind of a different form of the Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain people are familiar with. Um, a key point of attack is that it's important to focus on the entire adversary life cycle. People so often focus just on perimeter defenses, right? If I lock my firewalls, they're never going to get in. We know that's not true. We know adversaries are getting in. So we also have to look for them after they've gotten in with the assumption they will. So breaking down, there are a few different flavors of attack. Focusing before adversaries have exploited you is pre-attack. That covers things like information gathering from your websites or setting up infrastructure they would use to spearfish you later. And then we have enterprise attack, which covers that initial access through command and control. And that covers things like moving laterally through your network or exfiltrating data. In addition to pre-attack and enterprise attack, attack also covers multiple what we call technology domains. So within enterprise, we cover Windows very heavily and Linux and Mac. Uh, we cover those as well, but they're not as mature as Windows. So if anyone has Linux or Mac expertise, come talk to us afterwards. We also have mobile attack, which covers Android and iOS. So now that I've intro to attack, I'm going to turn it over to John, and he's going to get into more detail. Yeah. Thanks, Katie. So if you're already familiar with attack, you've probably seen what we call our matrix view. Uh, it looks basically like a giant table. So I want to dig into that um, and just talk about what each of those are. So across the top here, you have what we call the tactics. Uh, these are basically the goals the adversary is trying to achieve. Like, what are their technical objectives? So some of their objectives might be they want to collect information, they want to move laterally, they want to escalate privileges. So these are, think of them as the things the adversaries are trying to do when they're on our systems and networks. And then down, you have what we call the techniques. So techniques are different ways that adversaries can achieve those goals. So for example, they might be able to move laterally via several different technical mechanisms. We call those techniques. Uh, you can see we're probably building out the TTP framework if, you've, uh, if you're familiar with that. Uh, and then within each one, so within each cell of this table, you can actually click in and get a lot more detail, including what we call the procedures, which are basically, you know, the exact mechanisms that any individual adversary group would use, so the command lines and things like that, so how they execute this technique. So this is the matrix. It's basically a table. Across the top, you have the tactics. Down the columns, you have the techniques. And if you dig in, you can click in and get a lot more information. So looking at that extra information, this is all available on our web page, which I'll show you a uh, link to in a bit. Um, so this is an example of a technique, new service. So new service is a way adversaries can achieve um, persistence and things like that. Uh, in this case, what we have is a description. The description talks about two important things. One of them is like, what is the actual functionality? What is the like, like attack is about things that adversaries do. They're using legitimate behavior generally. Creating a new service is something that, you know, all programs do all the time. Um, so what is that functionality? And then how do adversaries use that to achieve malicious goals? How do they use this to achieve persistence, for example? So that's what the description is, those two important things. Uh, platform is very obvious. That's just what does this apply to? So this would be you know, Mac, Linux, Windows, or mobile. It might be um, iOS or Android. 
permissions required, I think, is also obvious. This is you know what you need and what permissions you need in order to achieve this technique. And then effective permissions, especially if you look at like privilege escalation, you might have new permissions at the end after you execute the sneak than than before you had it. We also have ideas of how to detect this. This isn't definitive. This isn't like the be all end all. One thing we try to do with attack is stay away from telling you how to do defense. What we're trying to do is describe what the adversaries are doing. But we do have some ideas here, different things you can look at to try to detect this. For example, for new servers, you can look at monitoring service creation, right? That seems obvious. Um, and we also talk about mitigations. How, you, how can you prevent this from being a problem in the first place? So it's about detection. So after the fact, how can you detect this being used? And before that, how can you help mitigate these uh, attack vectors coming in? Another really important aspect of this is data sources. How can you actually see this? What logs should you be collecting in order to be able to see new services being created? So for example, Windows registry changes are important. You can use process monitoring, command line parameters, things like that to detect new service creation. Uh, next, really important, as Kitty mentioned, attack is really based on real world observations of adversary behavior. So within the examples here are examples of threat groups that actually have used new service to carry out their attacks. So you can check there, it's all based on open source reporting. Each of these will have a reference. Another important piece of data, so this is all open. None of this is closed intelligence. It's all available online. So you can click through and see the original reporting from the, um, from the source. As I talked about, so we have examples of the threat groups. So we also have short pages for each of the threat groups themselves. So for example, APT28, this threat group's um, you know, the one that's been attributed to the Russian government and the DNC hacks that's been in the news recently. Um, so for each of these threat groups, we have basically this short description. We have some information, like other names they're known by. As you probably know, there's um, different vendors will have different names for how they consider the groups. Government organizations may have different names for what they call the groups. Uh, this is a best effort. It's not meant to be exhaustive. And obviously, there's sometimes not perfect overlap in these things. But it, it at least tells you, you know, if somebody's talking about Fancy Bear and you're looking at AP228, you know, those are roughly the same thing. Uh, then obviously you want to know what are the types of techniques that these adversaries are using? What does APT28 do when it attacks you? Uh, and so this is um, the set of attack techniques basically. And again, there's references for each of these. So it'll link to a report that says, when did APT28 use a new service or data obfuscation or connection proxies, for example. So you can see the source reporting. You don't have to just trust us. Uh, and then also a lot of adversaries obviously use um, software. So they use malware, they use different utility tools, they use built-in tools, and we'll have um, the list of software that we've seen them to be using as well. And again, the references. So digging into software, for example, Chopstick is a malware family. Um, again, similar to the group pages, this is basically just serves to link to the technique. So what are the different types of techniques that, um, that this tool is capable of performing? So if you see this tool on your network, you might want to look for these different types of techniques and things like that. Uh, and then obviously also you want to know what groups are using this piece of software. And again, you want to have references so you can really dig into the source reporting again. So we've talked about what attack is a lot. Um, probably also important to understand how are we going to use this thing? Uh, we typically talk about these four use cases. And more importantly, it's also the communication between these four use cases. We'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, you can start with Katie's going to talk about threat intelligence, how you can use attack to describe your threat intelligence. I'll talk about detection, how you can use attack to better describe your detections and to better build your detections so you're detecting adversary behavior. You, we can use attack to do assessments in engineering. So you've, if you're familiar with attack, you may have seen these heat maps is what we call them, just different colorings of the attack matrix. This is really helpful as a um, tool of tracking where you stand in your defense. Am I covering the things I need to be covering? What am I missing and how do I get to filling those missing gaps? And then adversary emulation is another really important use case. So this is all about, um, we know we want to understand the adversary. And the best way to understand the adversary is by being the adversary, essentially. So adversary emulation is all about trying to pretend to be APT28, using the techniques that APT28 uses in order to better validate our own defenses, to make sure that we're detecting what we think we're detecting, to make sure we're mitigating what we think we're mitigating, and to make sure our assessments are actually accurate and measured against ground truth. Uh, so what are the resources? As Katie mentioned, Attack is all available for free online. Um, the best place to get to that is attack.miter.org. If you remember one thing from this talk, remember, go to attack.miter.org. You can see all of our content there. There's a public website. It's built on uh, MediaWiki right now. Katie will talk about some updates to that coming up. Um, this has the matrix. It has each of those technique pages. It has all of the software pages and all of the group pages, as well as some other resources I'll talk about in a minute. 
Um, if you're a fan of like JSON and structured content or you want to do scripting around attacks, so for example, maybe you want to count the number of techniques used by an adversary or you want to ingest this into your own repositories, we have Styx and Taxi available. Styx is a JSON format for cyber threat intelligence. Taxi is just a way of getting that to you. Um, so this is structured content that's available on um, MITRE's GitHub page. You can also get to that from attack.mitre.org. We also built a tool called the Attack Navigator. So we don't want to tell you how to use Attack, but at the same time, we know it's helpful to have tooling that will help you work with it. So the nav Navigator is all about making it easier to work with Attack. So you can color different cells, you can add notes to different techniques, and you can use that to kind of capture what you're doing with Attack. So if you're building out your defensive program, for example, you can say, I'm going to color all the things that I think I'm detecting in green uh, in the Navigator. Again, the Navigator doesn't tell you exactly what to do, but it does help you do it. Uh, and then we have adversary emulation plan. So like I said, it's helpful to understand what the adversaries are actually doing, how you can be them, what that looks like, all the way from the top level to how they go about planning out their attacks, all the way to the lower level of what commands are they actually plugging in, what things are they running to do each of these techniques. And we've published uh, one adversary emulation plan right now. We're planning to publish at least one more uh, that talks about this, and other um, organizations are using attack to do similar things. These are all also available on attack.mitre.org. Uh, and lastly, I'll talk a little bit about this coming up, but we have a cyber analytics repository. Um, analytics are a way that people are talking about how to do detection for TTPs, so not looking just at indicators, but how do we detect the tippy top of uh, the pyramid of pain? How do we detect those behaviors? MITRE's published a cyber analytics repository, car.mitre.org, also available from attack.mitre.org, that has some things to start with, basically. So that's all that's available. The big thing to highlight here, attack.mitre.org, you can get to all of these other things from there. Um, so just remember that part. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Katie. Awesome. Thanks, John. So now I want to talk about how we can use attacks, specifically for threat intelligence. Um, I've been a threat analyst in SOCs for many years. And here are a couple of the challenges that I see of the way we're doing things right now. First of all, there are so many reports to read. <laughs> Open source, closed source, uh, things that are coming into email, things that your executive sends you, things on Twitter, things on Reddit, your RSS feed. It's a lot, right? Also, it can be really difficult to apply intelligence that you gather to your defenses, right? So, I don't know, any analysts in the room, you might have had this experience. You write this amazing 10-page report, detailed analysis, you know, you hedge your biases about this adversary, you hand it to your defenders, and they give you a look and say, what do you want me to do about it? Yeah, that's kind of a, a little bit of a sad day, but um, it's something that really happens. It can be really tough to you know, apply what you gather about adversaries to actual hands-on defenses, right? Also, our reliance on indicators. We talked about it earlier with the Pyramid of Pain. I think that one of the challenges and why we're so tied to these indicators, IP addresses, domains, is that they're countable, right? And we all like metrics, and we like to feel that if we have you know, 5,000 indicators rather than 4,000, we're safer. That's not the case. Um, it's a kind of a game of whack-a-mole or whack-a-kitty. I like cats, no offense here. Um, but you know, we gotta do better. That's not gonna be sufficient. So these are some of the challenges we see in threat intel and that I've seen in my experience. So what do we do? We use attack to structure threat intelligence. And when I say this, a lot of people are sort of confused, so I want to walk through you an example report. Um, this is an older report from FireEye Operation Double Tap from 2014, but you could do this with pretty much any threat report that you have. So we're just going to walk through. You want to look for the behavior. Think about the behavior that the adversary is doing rather than you know, looking just for an indicator, and then we're going to map that back to the attack technique. So let's start off. First of all, they talk about a kernel vulnerability and that they're using to escalate privileges to system. That's one of our exploitation techniques, exploitation for privilege escalation. There's our first one. Next, adversaries used command line to run who am I to figure out who the system owner or user was. That's two techniques, command line interface and system owner user discovery. Moving right along, a really common persistent method, persistence method is scheduled tasks. Um, the adversaries did that, and that's a technique. Next up, a SOX 5 connection for command and control, which we track under standard non-application layer protocol. Also, their C2 was over two ports, um, 81 and 1913. These are sort of uncommon ones, so we classify those as uncommonly used ports, and also because they're doing different ports for C2, multi-stage channels. 
So in this one report, just a portion of a single report, we have seven attack techniques we've pulled out. So you can imagine, as we do this for multiple reports from many sources for different adversaries, you're going to get a massive library of different TTP information. So here's what we have on our website for APT28, one of the groups. I should mention that this is a collection of techniques based on open, publicly available threat reporting. We know that does not represent everything adversaries are doing, but it's the data that we have available. Um, so that's a really important bias to keep in mind. If you're going to use this data, it doesn't represent reality, but it does give us a sense of the techniques that the adversaries are, have known to use in public reporting. So that's APT28. I created this using the attack navigator that John mentioned earlier. Next, APT29, another Russian group. So if you cared about these groups, you might want to do mapping of your own sources that you have internally to what techniques they're using. And then what you can do, since it's all structured, bam, overlay 28 with 29. So we have 28 in yellow, 29 in blue, and the techniques that both groups use in green. So if these are the two threat groups that I was most concerned about, you have a really easy way to say, hey, the techniques in green, I should probably focus on prioritizing how I detect those. From there, you can take it a step further, right? If you look at your environment and you know what attack techniques you can detect or not, you can then overlay that. So just notionally, let's say these are the five techniques that I've looked at, the green ones. I know I can't detect those. Bam. We've gone from 219 techniques in enterprise attack to the five that based on threat reporting, we should probably be focusing on. And John's going to talk more about how you do that detection. I wanted to give a few examples from industry. Um, a few threat intel providers are starting to map their reporting and attack. McAfee is listing um, techniques at the end of their blog posts. Digital Shadows just released a blog post mapping uh, APT28 techniques from the GRU indictment. This is another example. Um, Unit 42, which is Palo Alto's threat intel team, has something they call adversary playbooks. I think there are up to five or so different groups they're mapping. They're using pre-attack and enterprise attack techniques to map out what adversaries are doing. And one thing I really like about this is they do it over time. So that's a really important thing, right? Adversaries change. So they map you know, what the adversaries have done over this six months, and then over the next six months. That gives you a way to compare behavior over time. A couple implementation tips. This can be tough if you're starting out and you're a small team. But here are a few tips I have to get started. First of all, tailor your existing threat intel repo. Um, the good news is some threat intelligence platforms are already starting to support attack natively. A few of those include MISP, which is open source, ThreatQ, which is a commercial product, and others. Or if you have a team of engineers and you have a custom homegrown thing, um, you can grab uh, attack through sticks and uh, see if you can implement it into your own threat intel repo. Next, have the threat intel originator do it. Um, I showed, for example, that command line that the adversaries ran uh, who am I? If you don't have the original data, it can sometimes be tough to figure out what technique an adversary is doing, right? So if you have actual intrusion data, that's gold to map to attack. Also, start at the tactic level. Um, it can be really tough. I know 219 techniques in enterprise, even more in pre-attack. There are only 11 tactics in enterprise and 15 in pre-attack. So think about what tactic, what's the adversary goal behind the behavior you're trying to map, then bring up that page and go from there. Also, use the existing website examples we have. The team has been mapping threat reporting for years. So we have hundreds of examples of how adversaries have used this. So do a keyword search. If you're not sure what HTTP is, throw it in there, and you'll bring up that that's the standard application layer protocol for C2. Also, work as a team. I mentioned this one because there was a great example of a report that John and I mapped separately. We each found techniques. The other didn't. This is human analysis, and it's prone to all those biases. You're more likely to see the techniques you know. That happens. But you can hedge against that by working together as a team. So what does this get us? We started with these issues, the status quo issues on the left. So many reports to read. OK, that's not going away. I can't do that. But if you structure your threat intel, and if uh, providers start structuring it, you're going to get that all in the same format, and you can more easily compare those TTPs. Also, tough to apply Intel to defenses, right? Now that it's structured, we can directly overlay our threat reporting with our defensive coverage. Next, the reliance on indicators. We talked about that. Attack gives a way to move to TTPs. Plus, it gives us a common language in those threat reports. If a blog post says, I'm talking about this attack technique, then you know what they mean. You don't have to guess, right? 
and also allows us to compare those groups like we did with 28 and 29. So now that I've talked to you about how you can use attack for threat intelligence to track those adversary behaviors, I'm gonna throw it over to John, who's gonna talk about how you actually detect those behaviors. Right, so. Okay, there we go. Um, thanks. So hopefully we've now moved from this point where we're getting our threat intelligence as a bunch of reports that you have to read. I know everybody hates reading. And now we're starting to get our threat intelligence in terms of attack. And this helps us solve a really important problem in detection. One of the biggest problems, at least I've seen in detection, is knowing what to focus on first. Like, what are the things that I need to be worried about, and what things can I wait until next month or the month after to focus on? It's like, there's all these things, there's all these reports that come out, there's all these new adversary techniques. What are the important ones for me? And what your threat intelligence can give you is really a good outline of, like, what are the things I should focus on right now that are likely to be problems? Um, a lot of times we've talked about um, doing detection based on indicators of compromise. Katie mentioned this at the beginning. So indicators of compromise, uh, as we talked about, are these like IP addresses, file hashes, things that we can share very easily and do detection on. Um, and then we see the pyramid of pain and we know we're supposed to move to analytics. And a lot of times it's hard to understand like what does that really mean? What does it mean to do detection based on analytics? And this, I like to think of it as a spectrum. I'm sure other people will tell me I'm totally wrong and there's a very clear distinction. But I think of indicators as you know, known malicious behavior. These are IP addresses that we've seen the adversary using and we know they use. They're hashes for pieces of malware that we know are bad. Um, and there also tend to be many of them. Uh, we talk about, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions or billions of indicators. Like, there's all these indicators of badness. And analytics, on the other hand, are detections for things that look suspicious that adversaries tend to do. So, you know, like I talked about, creating a new service, doing um, reading from LSAS in a weird way that lets them pull credentials out of it and things like that. So these are things that look suspicious versus things that we know to be malicious already. And that makes them a little more challenging to deal with. Uh, in particular, it means that we're often going to get more false positives. So we've all had the stories of, you know, the 8.8.8.8 indicators. So we, it's not like we don't have false positives with indicators. That means your indicator is bad, though, whereas with analytics, it's kind of a fact of life that we're going to detect things that look suspicious that are actually just our sysadmin figuring out that all of a sudden they can use PowerShell to automate this thing they were not automating before. And so dealing with those false positives is one of the challenges that I'll talk about. Um, and the nice thing about indicators that kind of balances out that false positive problem is we have we need many fewer of them in order to do a broader set of detection because it's very, there's so many IP addresses. There's, you know, so many different file hashes even. There's so many different ways you can make a file to create a different hash. On the other hand, there's only so many ways to get credentials out of a Windows machine. There's only so many ways to create persistence. And so we can have more on the order of dozens and hundreds of, of analytics versus, you know, millions and billions and trillions or whatever of indicators. Um, so I talked about how analytics differ from indicators, but what are analytics really? How do they work? Um, and a lot of you are probably familiar with this. I'll go over it again. So analytics really look at the observable events and artifacts uh, from a system that indicate adversary behavior. So if an adversary uses uh, a new service to create persistence, what does that look like? If an adversary uses RDP, what does that look like? A lot of times we'll see this in log data. So when you RDP to another machine on a Windows environment, Windows event logs will log that and they'll show it as a login event with the type equals to remote interactive. And that means if you're looking to detect lateral movement via RDP, then you can look for those log entries and know that that's happening right now. Um, and now you're probably thinking, well, crap, everybody does RDP. I use that all the time myself to administer boxes. So that's the trick really with an analytic is how do we distinguish the fine uses of this technique, the things that my sysadmins do and my users do from the things that adversaries are doing. Um, so if you look at what's in attack, it's a lot of things that are typically used day to day in your enterprise. And so you're going to find that a lot of things are in this gray area where there's all this behavior that we know to be good, all this behavior that we know to be bad, and then there's this fuzzy gray in their area in the middle. And what we're trying to do with analytics is when we get an, a new event to come in, we want to build up a set of evidence and then pull apart those circles so that we can understand which circle does this actually live in. Is this a thing an adversary is doing to me or is this thing um, that I don't have to worry about that my, you know, is normal in my environment. And so that's what an analytic is. It's really writing these searches against our log data that lets us separate the good from the bad uh, and really alert on the bad and send that to something to our responders. Uh, what that can look like in practice, this is a Splunk search. It's um, super incomplete. Please don't write this down or anything. I just want to highlight the key components of it. Um, so first, a lot of uh, stuff in attack is really reliant on endpoint data. This is um, 
you know, traditionally, as Katie talked about, we do a lot of detection at the perimeter. We're looking for things coming in and things going out. Um, a lot of the stuff in attack is really focused on what the adversaries are doing once they're in, and so that means we need to collect a lot of endpoint data. One common way of doing that is using Sysmon, uh, and so what that means is we narrow our search to Sysmon, and in this case, we're looking for a UAC bypass. UAC is user account control. This is a, um, if you're familiar with Windows, it'll pop up a box and tell you it's asking for admin privileges. Um, there's ways of getting around that. Programs can kind of write off of normal operating system functionality. Obviously, operating systems need admin functionality all the time. And so what they can do is they can hook into that. And so that's what a user account bypass is. Um, so what we're looking for is really processes that have an integrity level of high, so things that have been elevated. And then what we can do is try to find the ways that programs can hook into these things. So there's a um, GitHub page called UACME that has a list of like 42 of them. I've listed like two of them here. One thing they can do is they can try to hook into the fodhelper.exe file. That's not important what that is. They kind of hook into that and try to run a program off of that. And so the end result of that is maybe they only had user privileges before, but they are able to get admin privileges without popping up a box that might prompt you and warn you that something's wrong. So they're able to work around that. And so we want to detect that. We want to find that suspicious usage of this. Uh, similarly, they can use cleanmanager.exe with some specific flags and things like that. Uh, and then in the green at the bottom, what we're doing is we're just kind of categorizing that. One thing you want to make sure of with your analytics is that they are useful to your um, responders and your analysts. So when they get an alert, they want to understand what it is. And so what we do here is we kind of tag it as which UAC me technique it is. So they can then look at that and understand how to investigate it. Even once we have all these filters in place, you're probably still going to find false positives. Um, so how do you go about doing this? Um, the first really important thing to writing an analytic is understanding the attack. You want to not just understand what it looks like in the logs, but you really want to understand what is the adversary trying to do with this? What is their goal? And how does that look different than just some guy doing his job on your networks? Uh, so how do you separate those things out? How do you know what the adversary's goals are? And the best way of doing that is to try the attack. Um, so look at different ways of carrying out these attacks yourself. Spin up a VM that you can toss out after you're done, or you know, find a test network and carry out the attacks and see what they really look like. Collect the logs yourself, and then try to create a search that really finds those things specifically, like the specific badness. You're going to find your first search is probably also going to find a lot of good things. It's going to find just people doing their jobs, as I've talked about. And your trick is going to be kind of writing and iterating that, better understanding the attack, trying different ways to make sure that you're getting a search that isn't overfitted to an attack, so it's not looking for something too specific, but at the same time isn't too general that it collects too many alerts and you have you know, too many false positives, essentially. So you can kind of think of this as just feeding into itself. And you, it, this isn't a one-time thing, so you might do this. You might get a, an analytic that makes sense right now this month, and then next month you buy a new product, and all of a sudden you're getting a ton of false positives. This is an iterative process. You'll also find that the adversaries will discover some new way of doing this, and you'll have to broaden your analytic to detect that. So this is not a once-and-done thing. You have to keep maintaining your analytics over time. Um, so as I talked about, one of the best things that attack gives you is really a way of understanding, A, what priorities you should have in building out your detection program, but also understanding where you stand in your detection program. What are the techniques that adversaries are using that I have no ability to detect right now? What are the techniques that I will see sometimes? What are the techniques that I'm pretty confident that I'll see if they happen on my networks? And attack gives you kind of a scorecard. Um, of what that looks like. So in this example, we have things in green that we're probably pretty good at detecting, things in yellow that maybe we're moderately good at, and things in white that we still need to build out detections for. So you're presented with that map, and there's like 219 techniques. That's a lot, right? Uh, we're not going to be able to do all of those um, immediately. And so what you can do is then take the information from your threat intelligence and really figure out which of the, which, what's the next one I need to look at? What is the next thing that... Um, will give me the most bang for my buck, the most value in spending my analyst time on. And for example, we can highlight that in orange, and then that'll give you kind of a plan to build out your detection, to go from where you are now to having a comprehensive detection for the things you know you need to detect. And we can again think of this as a cycle of defining what our threat model is, what are the things that we're worried about, um, assessing our coverage, so understanding where we stand right now, identifying gaps in that coverage, and then filling those gaps and doing that all over and over again. Again, keeping this up to date. Um, even with that, though, even with that prioritization, uh, filling these gaps is hard, it's time consuming, and it's expensive. It's hard because it requires a lot of information about like, what's actually happening on our systems. You need to know Windows systems internals. You need to know, you know, if you have a Mac environment, you need to know Mac systems internals. And that's going to be like a totally different skill set than your Windows team. Uh, and so that's hard. Uh, it's time consuming because it takes a lot of time to do this iterative process. You have to go back and forth a lot. You'll probably find things won't work and you'll have to start over. So it's time consuming and of course being time consuming means it's expensive. 
Um, but the good news is we're not alone. Um, there's a lot of folks that are working on this problem right now. Uh, for example, one of them I like to talk about, MITRE participates in this, it's the National Health ISAC, so this is a sharing community. Uh, they've spun up a working group around sharing analytics based on attack. The way that works is we meet every two weeks. Uh, every two weeks, one of the organizations will present a detection they've written for an attack technique. MITRE presented our UEAC bypass um, detection. And then all the other organizations that are particip participating can take that into their own um, into their own environment, try it out. They'll probably need to tweak it a bit. Nothing's going to be a perfect transition. It's not like indicators because there are there is this false positive problem, but it's a start. There's also other communities. We have the cyber analytic repository that's available for free at car.mitre.org. So if you're looking to start out, you can do that. Um, the MISP threat sharing platform, we were talking to them recently. They're trying to figure out how to do analytic sharing in MISP. So you can use that existing threat sharing platform to also share detections for adversary behavior. And then the Sigma project also available on GitHub. Um, they're trying to write a kind of a SIM neutral uh, query language, and as part of that, they're building out a lot of SIM content for analytics. Um, that said, we don't have this problem solved. There's a lot of things that we're still working on and that I think still need folks like yourselves to look at. So one of those is being realistic about coverage. So I talked about attacks as a scorecard, and that makes a lot of sense for some cases. It's really easy to understand. It feels great to change a color for a cell from like yellow to green or something like that. But it is a little bit overly simplistic when it comes to building detections and writing detections. Um, you'll often find that the best way to do a detection for some technique is really to look at a chain of techniques. So looking at several things in a row, because then you'll, you won't alert on too many false positives. And so that means then that this scorecard becomes more of a qualitative exercise than a quantitative exercise. Your green doesn't really mean that you're fully covered against this. It means that we think we're probably covered by this. We feel confident as an analy analyst judgment that we are. And so it's just important to understand that coverage needs to be realistic, but at the same time, attack does give you that scorecard and that thing to always go back to. Second challenge area is handling false positives. So as I talked about, we, um, our SOCs are already over overloaded. Just looking at indicators and other alerts coming off our firewalls and things like that. And all of a sudden, we're being told that we need to build out this big detection program based on adversary behavior. 219 techniques, you know, all these different threat groups, they're all doing different things. And we're telling our analyst team that then we, they need to look at these false positives as well when they're already you know, busy 24 seven, basically. Uh, so how do we do that? How do we deal with this false, prob false positive problem? Um, so as I talked about, one of the best ways I have seen at least, um, and this is super common right now, is looking at event graphs. So rather than looking at each event in isolation, look at it, chains of them. Um, I like to throw this meme in here because I think like half the audience might get this. This is from The Graduate. Um, updated for today, it's all the graphs now. Look at graphs. Um, Neo4j is huge. Um, basically, it's... It's a way of just tailoring or narrowing down what you're finding based on chains of activity. Uh, machine learning also, you know, is a buzzword in some senses. In other senses, you know, it's a great technique to do um, classification of, you know, behaviors into good and bad. Uh, I like to include this meme because it's totally ridiculous. I don't know what he's doing. He's looking at something and he's glowing. Um, tighten the feedback loop. So. As your uh, analytics are creating all of these alerts, um, your analysts are going to look at them and they're going to tell you whether it's a false positive or true positive because they need to go analyze that, they need to go figure out, is this something real that I need to worry about and respond to or is this just a uh, false positive? And they're telling you good information each time they do one of those uh, triages, basically. They're trying to say, they're telling you that your um, analytic is you know, correct or is incorrect in a certain way. So listen to them, don't be like Michael Scott, um, take their feedback into account um, because they're telling you good information and you don't want to ignore that just because they're a first line analyst. Um, and then you can target your detection. So don't try to detect all of the things all of the time because that is a recipe for overloading everything. Focus on what are your, what are your business critical or mission critical assets? What are the things that you need to protect? And then try to do your detections kind of on the pathway to those things. So what are the servers that have that information? What are the admin accounts that have access to those servers? What are the user accounts that have access to those servers? Sorry, I know my mic is cutting in and out here. Um, and, and focus on those, because that will let you narrow down your false positives. You'll only see those things that are you know, important to your business. Um, yeah, so focus on your priorities. What are the things that are really important to you? And spend your time on those things, rather than trying to solve all of the problems all of the time. Uh, and then the last problem is um, analytics are requiring increasing and increasing amounts of data because adversaries are getting better at hiding in the noise of our normal systems operations. They're better at kind of um, 
mirroring exactly what we do, and that means we need more data about exactly what is going on. We need better endpoint data, we need better network data, we need better infrastructure data, and all of that data requires resources to collect, it requires uh, resources to search, CPU and things like that, so how can we improve that? How can we better target our collection? Can we do agile collection so that we're you know, collecting a lower baseline and then when something goes wrong, can we increase that and really detect um, much more once we know something is wrong? Uh, and can we decentralize collection so we don't have to like collect all the things and aggregate them into one place? Uh, and how can we do like, so we talk about graph-based search, but one of the big challenges that we have run into, at least at MITRE, is like making that scale across uh, a medium or large size organization can be really hard because you have so many different connections and things. And graphs have a big, you know, connectivity issue. So how can we make graph-based search scale? And how can, how can we make effective use of our resources? So how can you make sure you're not blowing all your money on Splunk license and you're using it correctly? Uh, and the last thing I want to leave you with is, um, like, how can we get started on our own? So how can we, um, you want to go from where you are now to being able to do analytics. Uh, so this is a step-by-step -step here. First, take a look at Detection Lab. Detection Lab is basically a set of scripts and utilities that will help you build out a sample Windows environment. It comes with some red team tools. It comes with sensing and all that built in. And it'll basically let you get started quickly. There's a, a Medium post here. You can also Google for this pretty easily. Um, and then you're going to want to know, how do I be bad? So I'm not a skilled adversary emulation person. I do not have those skills at all. Um, Atomic Red Team has a lot of commands that you can try, so you're not going to be able to mirror your Red Team uh, unless you are the Red Team. You'll want to work closely with them, but if you're just looking to get started, take a look at Atomic Red Team. That'll have a lot of kind of commands you can plug in to carry these things out. That's from uh, Red Canary. Um, and then lastly, like see what that looks like. Do it, try it, uh, and write some detections, and then share what you've learned. Um, this is still an emerging area. You might find that some people have already um, done what you have done, but we're all still learning. Uh, so please share what you have. Write a blog post, try to tweet, well, retweet it, um, and tell us how you're detecting these attack techniques. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, bringing it all together. So we're talking about MITRE ATT&CK as this framework to describe threat intelligence, to do detection. Um, and to do adversary emulation. So what does this really look like? So if you can structure your threat intelligence using attack, that gives you a common vocabulary, right? It's like whenever I see this technique being used in my report, I give it the same name, and then I can trend that over time, right? I can understand how the attacks are changing, I can do prioritization. You can then feed that into your detection program. So what are the things that I actually need to detect on a day-to-day -day basis, and what can I kind of you know, put as a lower priority. And you can also feed that into your adversary emulation and your red teaming. So your red team is carrying out the things that you are facing on a daily basis. They're not kind of off in their own corner. They're based on the threat intelligence, so they're based on what the adversaries are doing. And then you can feed that into your defensive process as well. So your red team, when they carry out an attack, they tell you exactly the techniques that they did. You can look at your detection and say, which of those should I have detected? Which of them did I detect? Which of them did I miss? And it just gives you like a common vocabulary to use across all of these. And I'll hand it back over to Katie to talk about what we're doing next. Thanks, John. So we've told you where attack is today, and now we want to talk about where it's going. We know it's not perfect. We have plans to kind of try to improve it over time with the community's help. So first of all, we want to improve on the content we have and add to it. A few upcoming things the next few months you'll see are the addition of sub-techniques, which is another level of detail beyond techniques. A good example is, uh, for example, credential dumping as a technique. Lots of ways you can do that with different detections, right? So we want to break those down. Also looking at impacts. Things like destructive malware, destroying data, they don't map too well to attack in its current form, so how do we address that? Maybe adding a new tactic, working on that. Also looking at new technology domains, things like cloud. What does attack for cloud look like? What do we have to add to that? Next, continuing to expand the attack community. We've had an amazing kind of grassroots rising of people who are using attack. We hit 10,000 Twitter followers last month, and we haven't really tried that hard to do that. People are finding it useful, and we want to keep spreading that word so that others can use attack. Also, we're looking at opening up the governance. Um, right now, MITRE maintains attack. We want to start pushing that towards other community members getting advice on what we should and shouldn't add. So we'll be announcing something along those lines in the coming months. And last, John mentioned it. In September, we're pretty excited. We have a new website coming. If you love MediaWiki, I'm really sorry, but it's going away. It's time. The new website is Sticks Taxi based, so much easier to work with, a new infrastructure. The taxi server is already up. So for anyone who's using the old MediaWiki API, please transition to taxi. That would be awesome. All right. 
that's all we have for uh, presentation material. Um, open it up if anyone has questions. If this is the first time you've heard this, like what do you think? How can you use this? For those who are already using Attack, we'd love to hear about how you're using it, if there are any challenges, anything we can do to help you better. All of those things. Um, I think we have about 10 minutes, so open it up. All right, in the cobalt blue shirt, is that cobalt? I think that's cobalt blue. Yeah, you. Is that cobalt or purple? I don't know. Yeah, so um, just as a plug, because I, I already use it, but um, could you tell me more about Caldera? Caldera? Yeah. Oh, thanks. I'm so glad you I've asked. I've heard of this. I'm not sure it just applies, applies to volcanoes. I think yeah, it Yeah, I'm going to bring up a Blake Strom, everybody. Ooh. Blake is not only a t the attack lead, he's also the Caldera lead. So rather than me fumbling through it, you get to hear from Blake. So what specifically about Caldera? <laughs> yeah. OK. Um, so the story of Caldera goes back to the Fort Meade experiment, the project that sort of drove, uh, drove attack and car and a lot of the, the follow-on work. Uh, so we were continuously doing these adversary emulation exercises with a manual red team. And we thought, wouldn't it be great if we could try to automate that process? Um, so we created a system that uh, we defined uh, pre and post conditions for the techniques uh, that we're implementing and developed an online planner um, that can essentially start with zero knowledge of the environment um, with patient zero. Um, so you choose which uh, host gets started. Um, and it can uh, perform the discovery techniques out of attack on its own as it's building its internal representation of the, the network. And then it will, if you've selected uh, use this persistence technique, remove light early in this way, and dump credentials, it can piece those things together and execute the sequence of actions um, for more rapid testing to develop uh, analytics and refine your defenses um, in a more automated way. So it's very useful for people who don't have their own red teams uh, to sort of see the, their network through the eyes of an adversary. And if that sounds interesting, um, the good news is our colleague Andy Applebaum is actually going to be talking about Caldera at the DEF CON AI Village on Saturday. He's also presenting at the Blue Team Village on Friday at DEF CON. So either of those topics interest you, catch him there. Um, we'll do second row, woman in the glasses. Oh, we'll wait for a mic one sec. Just I'm bad at repeating questions, so you know. It's a follow-up question. Mm -hmm. Um, is that for external or and the internal infrastructure? Caldera? Caldera is open. Anyone can use it. No, I mean in terms of attacks. Are we attacking the external infrastructure yeah, using Caldera or can we also use it for internal infrastructure? It's uh, strictly pros compromise. So if you have an internal network, you're looking at adversary behavior. It's, it's useful for that. Okay. Cool. Other questions? Comments? Yeah, over there. Um, let's out. go second row back, I guess. <laughs> Sorry, third row back. <laughs> or we'll do third row back. Maybe. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Uh, are there any plans to map the similar items between different technology domains? So, like in Windows, you have new service. On Mac OS, you have. Um, launch agents and launch daemons. Are, is there anything overarching you're looking for to connect the same or similar attacks? That's not a bad idea. I mean, right now we're dividing it by technology domain, but um, I think because it's so different in how you detect it, right? Um, but I, there's no reason why we couldn't try to find some other underlying behavior. Something we hadn't thought about, not on our roadmap, but it's a reasonable suggestion. Cool. I think one more up from. Second in. Um, how is, um, I mean, is there anything with attack that can uh, work with misattribution? So how is it dealing with mis misattribution? So something like um, the leaf, um, I don't remember what that was, um, just like a couple days ago, and um, it being at misattributed to uh, energetic bear and um, other kind of uh, attack technology. So, yeah. Sure, sure. So we get the question sometimes about, can I use attack for attribution? You can use it as kind of one piece of evidence, but I wouldn't use it like the EPT28 graph I showed. If you see those exact techniques, I would not lead that to the conclusion that that's definitely EPT28. Attribution is really tough and much more complex than that. It can maybe give you a hint, like, hey, these techniques have been used by these groups in the past. That's sort of a starting point. So for that reason, I wouldn't be too concerned about misattribution. 
um, because it's only one piece of the puzzle in the very complex puzzle that is attribution. And that's a whole separate talk, but good question. How about way in the back there? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Making them run. Giving you a workout. Geez. Keep going. Gray shirt. Which gray shirt? They're there you go. Ones. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned that the uh, creating analytics is a life cycle process, and uh, I, I totally agree with that. I was wondering if there's any good ways for managing the analytics as you create them. I haven't really seen any good uh, anything out there other than Excel for as yeah. a reference. I'm thinking something as a reference for the state of the analytic, um, the description of it, the details, maybe possible investigations, things that you could reference in a ticket for other people to, to take a look and get more context about what they're supposed to do um, and whatever you know, log, network, uh, alert that they receive. Um, I just really haven't seen anything along those lines. Yeah, um, unfortunately I haven't seen anything that is fully production ready yet. There are some projects that are kind of developing out. This is still a new area. One of them is the Unfetter project. This is an open source project from the NSA. You can find that on GitHub. It kind of does that content management system for your analytics for you. Um, uh, Unfetter. Um, U-N-F-E-T-T-E-R. Unfetter. Yeah. Unfetter. Of course. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so take a look at that one. Um, they're still in development. They're doing active development right now to kind of build that out. It also does some of the uh, charting of understanding what data sources you need. Um, so what data sources do I need to, in order to use this analytic? But yeah, that, that's a great problem, I think, that we're still trying to solve. I know tracking analytics is definitely hard for us as well. Um, how about the woman? Right next to the mic. Yeah, it's easy. <laughs> Hi, yeah, I was wondering if you could say more about what you were trying to use with graphs, like you highlighted that you think that they can make the real difference, and I was just curious what you were doing and w what problems you ran into with scaling most immediately. Yeah, sure, so there's an open source project uh, called Cascade. This is also available on MITRE's open source repository. What it was trying to do was it would plug into your SIM tool and it would try to connect different process trees and things like that and build out like what does this whole event look like in practice. And that makes a lot of sense if you already have a focus area that you want to look at because you can kind of constrain what the graph is and you can say if it's going too far beyond that stop. But running that type of detection across the whole network um, was just not doable for us at least. Um, I know some folks are looking at that using other types of databases and things. Um, and if anybody has success with that, I think that would make for a great blog post or something like that. We have time for one or two more. Um, Go for it, Katie. Which pick one? Which one? In the, In back. the back. We'll do the back Let's on the aisle. That. Another gray shirt. <laughs> Choice of the day. Another. It's actually a red canary shirt. Uh, Those are pretty sweet shirts. Um, it is. It is. I'm glad I got it. Uh, so a uh, question about how this project is being used in the community, in the market. You know, I've noticed a lot of vendors have latched onto it, yeah. uh, almost using it like a standard, like mapping their products to it. So, and I'm technically a vendor now, so that, you know, <laughs> apologize if this is a cringy question, but how, how would you prefer companies to work with you on that? Are you going to have like a, considering like a certification program or, you know, I don't, I don't know if you want to prevent anybody from just slapping, you know, attack logo on their product. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a really fair question. We're really happy, like I mentioned earlier, we're really happy to see the vendor community and everyone latching onto attack and using it. Um, one thing we've done to try to help with this, um, this is a spin-off effort that's kind of separate, uh, is an effort called Attack-Based Evaluations, led by Frank Duff. Um, we've announced, I believe, eight participants in the first round. This is going to be um, testing different EDR products against a subset of attack techniques in the style of APT3. So testing each of those products, kind of trying to articulate what the product's capabilities are compared to the attack techniques. And then we plan to publicly release those results in the fall. Um, so that's one way that we're trying to address that. Um, honestly though, I would say that you know, anyone who's talking to a vendor can ask, hey, and we've heard this from people, uh, they'll ask, hey, what out of the attack matrix can you cover? And then if you get that map, do the, do the test yourself, right? Ask for an eval, try Atomic Red Team, try some analytics, see what it detects, and you know, decide for yourself. So that's the advice I would give people who are looking at those products. Yeah, the other thing I would say is uh, we're happy to talk to anybody, whether you're a vendor, an end user yep. organization, email us at attack at mitre.org and we'll set up a you know, one or two hour phone call and kind of talk you through how we're seeing it being used, figure out how it fits into what you're doing right now. Yep, we are happy to do that. And with that, I think we're out of time. Follow us on Twitter. Um, attack.miter.org. 
We will be tweeting out slides. I should have said that up front. I'm sorry, I mean. We'll tweet out link to the slides so you don't have to worry about taking pictures. Just remember attack.mitre.org. Follow us on Twitter. Thank you all so much. Appreciate it.